Good afternoon. My name is Michael Wiltskit. I'm I serve as the director of the January series, and I wanted to share a few words as we close out our 2024 series. Over the past month, I've spent, as I've spent time with our speakers, one thing has become very clear. They are blown away at the diversity of ideas being shared, the accessibility of the content, the ability to choose how you participate, and that it's all available for free. Our underwriters and donors make this possible, and this series would not be possible without their gifts. Please honor these gifts by using what you learned this month to make our community stronger, better, and kinder places. In particular, I want to thank the Doug and Maria DeVos Family Foundation, the Meyer Foundation, Baker Bookhouse and Publishing, the Howard Miller Company, and the many daily and creative partners. Let's put our hands together to show them our appreciation. As I shared last year, there are so many hands involved in this project who each contribute to its reach and success. I'm particularly grateful for our catering team and Chef Ryan, the Prince Conference Center, our events team, marketing and communications, information technologies, advancement services, the video production team and Nate and Carl and Doug, our moderators, we had great moderators this year, and President and Mrs. Bohr, whose warm hospitality has been commented on by numerous guests. And Emily, Sheila, Miskana, Hannah, and Emily, they were so invaluable to me with their behind the scenes work and I'm so grateful for them. While today, though, is the final day of the January series, the learning gets to continue. The series will be back in April for a great partnership with Kent District Library. The July series will return again, and we'll be bringing back a January series speaker back to campus in the fall. So above all, friends, keep talking about what you learned this month. Keep reading, keep asking questions, and please keep being curious. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome to today's installment of the 2024 January series. I'm Emma Schmidt, a senior from Rockford, Michigan, studying math and piano performance. Would you all please take a moment to silence your cell phones? And as you're doing so, I would like to welcome our guests from all of our remote viewing locations including St. Joseph, Michigan, Manistee, Michigan, Kalamazoo, Michigan, and all our virtual attendees across all time zones. We are grateful that you are joining us today. And now would you please join me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be together today. We are so blessed to be able to gather freely under your name and to have the chance to learn more about the beautiful aspects of your creation. Thank you for the opportunity to hear from so many amazing speakers over these last few weeks and for helping those to go smoothly. Today, I want to pray specifically over Dr. Pearl Shanquan as she speaks to all of us today. Thank you for her invaluable work as a teacher, conductor, and speaker all across the globe, and for her special dedication to the choirs here at Calvin. I pray that you would calm her nerves and help her to communicate your message clearly today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And now, Dr. John Whitfleet, professor and director of the Calvin Institute for Christian Worship, will introduce our guest. For the past 26 years, Dr. Pearl Shanquan has led, Cal have led the choirs at Calvin with artistic excellence, innovative programming, a deep commitment to engaging global cultures, all as an expression of a deep and abiding Christian faith. We're so grateful. This very hall holds so many poignant musical memories. A big choral festival many years ago where we welcomed guest Moses Hogan, who arranged We Shall Walk Through the Valley in Peace for the occasion. Hush singing of Capella at a contemplative Good Friday service, O oh, love that will not let me go, leading to pure, silent prayer, such a gift. A 
performance of Brahms Requiem many years ago on Easter Eve that led into the full assembly singing Christ the Lord is Risen Today. Hundreds of Calvin alumni from choirs have memories like these, but not just from this place, but from all over the world. This past summer, in St. Francis' hometown of Assisi, Pearl led a remarkable festival chorus, including several of our students, in singing St. Francis' own prayer, Lord, make us instruments of your peace. I'll never forget it. While her work as a global clinician, symphony chorus master, and national president-elect of the American Choral Directors Association will continue, this is Dr. Chang Kwan's final year of teaching here at Calvin University. What a gift, what a gift that we can celebrate her today and pay deep attention to her vision. At the end of today's presentation, Dr. Shane Kwan will be available to greet you in the West Lobby. Calvin University is grateful to Holland Litho for underwriting today's presentation. Please welcome Dr. Pearl Shane Kwan. Thank you, thank you. Good afternoon. It's a great honor to be included in this lecture series. When I first received this invitation, I was extremely surprised, to say the least. I thought, I'm not old enough to be doing this sort of thing. <laughs> then I thought, maybe this being my final semester here at Calvin, this is a way for the powers that be to give me a final say and then good riddance <laughs> to that pesky conductor. It feels strange as normally in a public setting as a conductor, my hands do most of the talking. A couple of years after we moved here, I was at a social gathering. Someone said to me, you look kind of familiar. So I turned my back to this person <laughs> and I said, does this look more familiar? <laughs> to which this person said, oh, you're the conductor Pearl. So I promise I won't give a talk, this talk, with my back to you, as much as it is a more familiar and comfortable position for me. Often when I'm out guest conducting, after like six, sometimes eight hours of rehearsal, I will crawl back to my hotel room and completely zone out. At such times, I'm thankful for reruns of the TV show Law & Order where I can just watch and stare into space. Thus, in my classes here, I often talk about lawyers giving a summation. In a musical composition, materials from previous movements are often brought back at the end. For example, in 2022, right on this stage, we perform the Jubilate Deo by beloved American composer Dan Forrest. This work has seven movements. In the final movement, one hears the main melodies from all the previous movements. So in a way, today's talk can be considered a summation of my work here at Calvin for the past 25 years. What my students have heard and experienced in my classes, rehearsals, and performances. I don't have anything profound to say, only that hopefully some of this might be interesting and perhaps edifying. My late father used to say, if you don't have anything edifying to say in public, don't talk. <laughs> Speaking of my late father, well, I have had the blessing of studying with age, uh, legends in the choral field. To this day, his life and teaching still exert the strongest influence in my life. So much of who I am and how I approach life and work are from the lens of a child who grew up watching her father on his bended knees every morning and every evening, praying to his heavenly father. From a very young age, I saw the inner source of his strength and his success, which is not visible to the public. On the lighter side, this was a good deterrent, as his children always thought 
He had a hotline to heaven and could find out what you've been up to. And while my dad was the visionary, a man of big ideas, my mom was the practical one who made sure the kids were fed, taken to piano lessons, choir rehearsals, doctor's appointments, the stuff of daily life. I'm forever grateful to have had these two different approaches that have greatly influenced the balance of creativity and practicality in my life. So what one sees in the performance setting are, are the outward things, my arms waving, my body moving, choirs singing, instrumentalists playing. Today I'd like to share with you the behind the scenes of my work. While invisible in the concert, an essential aspect of a conductor's work is what and how one hears. Tuning the unisons, tuning the octaves, tuning the chords to lock them in. Perhaps one part is a little too loud compared to the others and thus mess up with the overall balance and so forth and so on. Beyond this kind of hearing of the music are other aspects of inner tuning that I've tried to instill in my choirs during my years here at Calvin. Tuning our minds. A few years ago, a student said to me, Dr. Shankwan, when I come to choir, I just want to feel and not have to think about it. Yes, my rehearsals are often a workout of minds, voices, and bodies. However, this kind of thinking isn't uncommon. For some reason, there's a perception that a choir rehearsal must be just fun, demanding less focus of mind and hearing. In first, Corinthians 14, it says, I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my mind. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my mind. Being in ensemble here at Calvin now means getting arts core credit. For me, in an academic setting, an ensemble is like other courses where there's attendance requirements and assignments and consequences where one is expected to work for that A. That's not an automatic grade. And my students here are nodding their heads vigorously. <laughs> that one should be a better singer and musician at the end of the semester compared to at the start of the semester. My students often hear me say that we're like a sports team. It isn't enough to know how to run and shoot basketball practicing the game strategies, knowing each other well enough to adjust very quickly. The timing of slowing down together or accelerating together. There's no app for this. Every member accepted into my choirs has an important specific responsibility to contribute to the team. And when we perform in public, I hope that it is the best that the ensemble can be. And yet, in our environment, whenever there's a schedule conflict between a sport game and a performance, it's automatic, it seems, for all involved, except for the conductor, that of course, one goes to the game and not seeing the performance. Where that ensemble, too, has been painstakingly built over the semester. Another student in my music and worship class, following a class visit, to a traditional worship service that used bulletins, described it as performative. For some reason, things have to feel spontaneous to be considered more real, more spiritual. Second Chronicles 5 describes the ark being brought into the temple. All the priests who were musicians stood on the east side of the altar, dressed in fine linen, and playing cymbals, harps, and lyres. They were accompanied by 120 priests sounding trumpets. The trumpeters and singers joined in unison, as with one voice, to give thanks and praise to the Lord. Now, this passage always makes the conductor in me go into overdrive, thinking about the staggering number of artistic details and rehearsal logistics. The passage continues with, Then the temple of the Lord was filled with a cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the temple of God. 
This has always been my aspiration for myself and for my students, that we humbly offer to God our absolute best. And that takes work and commitment. And may God find it a pleasing sacrifice. Yes, singing in my choirs take patience, persistence, delayed gratification, knowing that the results will be better for all all that work so that we can share with our listeners. Now, there's a joke that perhaps the U.S. Congress should try singing together. <laughs> there might be more harmony and less cacophony. So. I'm often asked why my choirs sing in many different languages. Once I took one of my Calvin choirs to sing in the church, and I was told that only pieces in English can be sung, even though translations would be given. This was especially challenging, as the theme of that service that we were presenting was about the worldwide body of Christ. This quote from the sixth century by an unknown writer in Africa, I am in the body of Christ, the church, which speaks in every tongue. When we take the time to learn other people's songs, we get a glimpse of that community, and we can put ourselves in their shoes for that short moment. We get on this side a glimpse of Revelation 7, where it says, after this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one can count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. Over the course of these 25 years, I've always programmed historical music, as well as music by living composers. After all, choral music began in the service of worship. And so much of choral literature is based on sacred texts. My students are used to me talking about the beauty and intelligence of Renaissance music or medieval chants. Beyond sharing the great artistry, it's also a lesson on the steadfast grace of God through the ages. A component of my programming is global music. I describe it, the mom in me describes it as an international buffet with a great variety of tastes and textures. These two perspectives, historical and global, come together in the shape of a cross. The grace of God through the length of time and breadth of space. Every program that I've done here at Calvin, its foundation has been the cross, like a cathedral floor plan. Tuning our ears. At the start of each rehearsal, my students would hear me play an A or an A major chord on the piano. I asked them to imagine if an orchestra concert started without the instrumentalist having tune to that A from the oboe, what would the music sound like? As in our spiritual life, we must tune to the A of God's word. Feelings fluctuate, but God's word, according to Psalms 12, is flawless. This tuning needs to be done often, even daily. Conductors are trained to anticipate and spot difficult details, analyze, and in rehearsal, do preemptive things to work through these difficult spots, and with patience, hopefully. In Exodus 16, the Lord gave the Israelite community manna, bread, for their sustenance in the desert. He commanded them to gather these daily, each one as much as is needed. They were told no one was to keep any of it until the morning, and of course, some did, and found that it had rotten. In a spiritual sense, the type A planner in me often want to hoard God's grace for tomorrow, for next week. And yet the lesson is to gather every day, trusting in his goodness sufficient for the day. This tuning is my daily appointment that doesn't show up on the Outlook calendar. After Gabe leaves for school, I go to a special corner in our house to sit and listen 
and tune to gather the manna for the day. In choir, the unified sound is achieved when everyone hears and produces the exact same center of the pitch or pitches and form with their mouths the exact same vowel shape and match the vocal timbre. This takes intense listening, not just on the part of the conductor, but also from every singer. When this all locks in, I call it choral math. One plus one equals three, which makes the math majors in my choirs twitch involuntarily. <laughs> my students often hear me say, don't substitute volume for artistry. When I get to attend a concert, it's the softer and softer, softest passages that I listen to because that's where the level of craft is most evident. In our society, those who speak the loudest, belligerently, outrageously, get the most attention. But in the book of 1 Kings, the Lord said to Elijah, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, and after the fire came a gentle whisper. And that's when the Lord spoke with Elijah. I carry a set of earplugs in my purse because we live in a very loud world. And even this may be quiet on the outside, but it's quite loud inwardly. We go to restaurants and we have to yell to be heard above the very loud music. I have sat in some worship services where despite wearing earplugs, my chest continues to keep pounding and I could hardly breathe, let alone try to think and focus. Good music has a variety of dynamic levels. Yes, there will be loud chords, loud passages, but it's the sustained loudness with no oral relief that I wonder, what is it trying to hide? It's perfectly understandable in a larger worship space to amplify a single solo instrument, violin, flute, guitar. But is there really a need to mic a grand piano when its lid can be fully open? Or to mic a drum set? Must it be unrelentingly loud to serve its purpose? And what is its purpose? Can we hear the congregation lifting its voice? Or is that secondary? My singers know this phrase very well. In the choral rehearsal, nitpicking is a sign of choir mama love. <laughs> so we continue to fine tune to clear away distractions of fuzzy tuning, lack of ensemble, lack of diction, and so forth and so on, so that the message of the song can emerge. Occasionally, I can't fix things despite using different choral techniques. But when the choir members listen acutely to each other, then it locks in. The same in spiritual life. It's not to frantically do this or that, but to listen. Create a space to listen and without checking our phones. A musical aspect I regularly emphasize in choir is the silence in the music. The beats of rest in between give definition and shape to the phrases. Listen to the silence. In the book of Genesis, chapter 16 ends with, Abraham was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. Chapter 17 begins with, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him, and so on. 13 years of silence in between these two verses. 13 years of waiting, wondering if God still remembers his promises. 13 years of worry. 
13 years of trust that would only be affirmed years later. The silence between these two verses was when the rubber of faith hit the road of reality. Sometimes listening takes on a different form. So in 2009, I had the privilege of conducting the Grand Rapids Symphony in a GR Bach Festival concert. It was a program of Foley of Bach. What a joyful program. It also coincided with the first of what would become 10 years of a struggle for our disabled son, Gabriel, with a rare blood disorder. The first six years were particularly hard as I ran in and out of classes rehearsals. And so we spent a lot of time at the pediatric hematology and oncology side of Helen DeVos Children's Hospital. I would run in with my bag of box music, find a corner where he was re receiving his infusion, and work on that music. A program of great joy prepped in a place where it is so easy to wonder, where is God in all of this? What have these children done to deserve this? Now, along with that program, I was also preparing another concert program that had a 10th century chant, Ubi Caritas, Ubi Caritas et Amor Deus Ibis, where love and charity are, there God is. So week to week at his treatment, sitting on the floor in that ward, one day I saw the love of the parents for the patients, the love of the patients for the parents, the love of the nurses and doctors for the patients and so forth. In such a place, there God is. So, what can a 10th century chant speak to modern people? Tuning our hearts. When I begin programming for a concert, the first thing I look for is the text. Then, does this composition or arrangement express the text well, and how so? I tell my students that while they are now 18 to 22 years old in my classroom, it's for their 30, 40, 55 years and beyond that I program for. That the text planted in their hearts through the choral music that we sing may bear fruit in their lives. I tell them it's not if, but when hardships in life come. And during those times of need, what will they draw upon from their repository that will bubble up and help carry them through? As such, I'm always intentional in programming arrangements of hymns in our repertoire. These beloved songs of the faith have endured through turbulent times in human history and were often written in response to great personal tragedies. Along the, alongside the Bible, these songs have been invaluable in the teaching and absorbing of scriptural truths. Both my late parents lingered in their final illnesses before their deaths. In their final years, the only form of communication that we could do to get through to them was the singing of hymns and reciting of scripture. Their mouths would move silently to the words of the hymns and Bible verses. My students also often hear me say, sing our prayers, pray our songs. Tish Harrison Warren, an Anglican priest whose books such as The Liturgy of the Ordinary resonate deeply with many, writes in her book, Prayer in the Night. For the Christian, the postures of prayer and work are interwoven. Ora et labora, pray and work. We work as prayer, and pray as work. And our prayer and work transform each other. If I may adapt this, we sing as prayer and pray as singing. And our prayers and songs transform each other. Elie Wiesel, 
the late Jewish author, who made it his life's work to bear witness to the genocide committed by the Nazis during World War II, was asked, after such experiences, how can you sing? To which he replied, how can you not? One day, trekking around Rome, Italy, a few years ago to escape the afternoon heat, I went inside a church. I literally gasped when I walked into this church and saw the beauty of this small Baroque church. It came to me so vividly that the whys of my life will fade in comparison when someday I stand before the who that I worship. My hope is that the music we sing will continue to point and lead us to the splendor of the presence of the who that we worship. In our small choral room, many pieces were first commissioned and rehearsed to be premiered in worship services and concerts and subsequently published. The Calvin Institute of Christian Worship has a choral series with GIA publications among its gazillion resources for worship, a series which I have edited in the past many years with my brilliant and dear colleague, John Whitfleet. As of this past December, here's a fun fact, this series has sold nearly 125,000 copies of choral music. My very first commission was when I took the Calvin Alumni Choir, a choir which I directed for 20 years to five Asian countries. I commissioned Roy Hopp, a Calvin alumnus and noted composer of choral music for churches. Many Colors Paint the Rainbow has to date sold over 3,400 copies. Roy, I hope that matches with, the real, uh, with your royalty checks that you've been getting. <laughs> so for my final commission with the Calvin Choir, I've asked Roy to write a piece, which he's entitled A Choral Prayer. This isn't a concert piece, but it's especially meaningful to me and my students as it's based on the slight adaptation of Psalm 141 that I often read to them before concerts. The original text is as follows. Let my prayer be set forth in your sight as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. The adaptation, let our songs be set forth in your sight as incense, the lifting up of our voices as a pleasing sacrifice. Today, you're hearing its premiere, sung by 23 <laughs> of 39 of the Capella students this semester. The rest are in classes, so they can't be here to sing. The ensemble will be accompanied by Dr. Ken Boss, another distinguished alumnus. And now to a more familiar position for me.
<clears throat> I'm not done yet. So. <laughs> I'll just wait a moment for them to sit down. But what a beautiful text. Thank you, Roy, for writing for us. <laughs> During the Calvin Women's Crowd Tour to South Africa in 2012, one of the most important destinations I made sure was included in the itinerary was a visit to Robben Island, where the late South African President Nelson Mandela spent 18 of his 27 years in prison for opposing the apartheid system. We visited his jail cell, and afterward, we gathered out in the yard, and we sang an arrangement of Amazing Grace. As we sang, our tour leader is a white Afrikaan. Our leader for that day is a black South African who was in prison in that same prison beforehand. The guides on Robben Island, a lot of them are former prisoners. So as we sang Amazing Grace on the yard, in the yard there, the white African put his arm on the shoulder of the black South African. We could hardly sing through the tears in our eyes seeing such a powerful, vivid expression of God's grace that made this kind of re reconciliation possible. During the pandemic, I would end each week of rehearsals taking out my basket to collect the thoughts and words of gratitude from the students to God for the week. There were things like, we're so thankful for good coffee, for warm boots, to be able to sing together in person again and not via Zoom. For composers that write well-crafted, beautiful music and many other items of thanksgiving. Like many characters in the Old Testament, we build an altar and call upon the name of the Lord at the end of the semester. At stops on concert tours around the country and other countries where my choirs have toured. I think back to those altars built in Japan, Singapore, Malaysia, Taiwan, the Philippines, South Korea, China, South Africa, Brazil, Spain, Portugal, Ireland, France, Switzerland, the Netherlands, England and Wales, Italy. I am a child of the church. When I was about eight years old, I was in the church children's choir for the Christmas Eve service. In my family, singing in the church choir was non-negotiable. <laughs> Try telling my dad you're going to quit choir okay? <laughs> or to quit piano lesson. So I was in the children's choir, and we were lined up. We sang our set of music, and then the children's choir um, was dismissed. Now, ever law-abiding, I don't know for what reason, I snuck back into church that night, and I hid behind the balcony railing. And I heard the adult choir sing the hallelujah chorus from the Messiah. I was blown away. I didn't have the understanding or vocabulary to express why the music I heard struck me so deeply. A glimpse of glory and heard in the context of worship outside of the concert hall. What are we feeding our kids at church and church-related institutions? What songs will they remember from these formative years when they're adults? What will they remember in their old age? Do they learn the commitment needed to developing their musical skills? Do they aspire to that the best is for the church, the body of Christ? In the words of Tom Traeger, whose scholarship focuses on preaching and worship and who writes hymn texts and lyric poems, here I quote, we never sing alone. 
Standing in the choir or in the congregation, you are surrounded by a great cloud, the whole company of musicians, and practicing an art that goes all the way back, and here he quotes Job 38, all the way back to when the morning stars sang together and all heavenly beings shouted for joy. Yet so often, the fine arts are the first to get cut. It takes so little to dismantle a program, to demolish a program. It's much, much harder to rebuild, even if possible. I am here today because my second grade teacher told this incredibly shy kid that she could sing. I'm here today because the church where I grew up had a children and youth choir program, and the youth groups offered many opportunities for leadership roles. I'm here today because I joined a community children's choir that toured internationally and which forever shaped my life. Through all those childhood years, if anyone had told this very introverted person, and my husband can attest to that, that I'd someday be a conductor who performs in public to hundreds and even thousands of people, I'd have vigorously said, no way. One of the great things my late father did in our lives was to identify the one talent from the biblical parable that each of his kids had and to instill the lesson that that one talent must be developed and used in thankful response to our creator. He told me many times, don't let anyone tell you that you can't do something because of your gender or your race. I'm often asked what it's like to be a woman conductor. When I step on the podium, I, think, I don't think of myself as a woman conductor, but as a leader, and one who conducts in thankful response to her creator. When I was an undergrad at Westminster Choir College in Princeton, New Jersey, the movie Chariots of Fire came out. Whether this happened in real life or not, there's a particular scene that spoke to me and has stayed with me all these years. The movie is about the Olympic champion, Eric Little, the runner who you refuse to run, run on Sundays, even at the Olympics. He would later become a missionary who served and died in China. When he reached a certain speed, Unlike runners who lean forward to get to the finishing line quicker to, build, to beat the com competitors, he would instead lift his face up to the heavens. He said, when I run, I sense the pleasure of God. When I'm on the podium, be it at Carnegie Hall or in a dilapidated church in the poor township of Soweto in South Africa, I give back to God the one talent that he's given me. For it is from him, through him, and to him that I can do this. I adapt this phrase from the book to sum up this summation from the book of Ecclesiasticus. The sum of my songs is, he is all. He is all. Alleluia. Amen. Thank you for your kind attention. We are so grateful that you have been faithful with this talent. And like the parable, we have seen it multiplied. And I can look at the faces of these students that we love so much and know that there are generations of students like them. 
and performers like them who have been influenced by God's work through you. And we would be remiss if we didn't say, well done, good and faithful servant. And we, uh, we are going to miss you. That's the other thing I want to make really. We're going to miss her, <laughs> right? <laughs> I know. So we're grateful. We're so grateful, Pearl. I can't believe it's been 26 years. It's amazing. We don't count the years. We don't count. We're just, we're just grateful. So you, talk, you tell the story of being in second grade, and someone tells you you could sing, and then you get involved in choir. Um, when was the moment that you thought, I could be a choir director? Not till many years later. So I had studied piano, and um, you know, the church sometimes needs an accompanist for the praise group and something. I was, I think, 12 when I began accompanying those poor people who had to put up with a 12-year-old kid accompanying them, and on and on. You know, church was such an important part of our life. Now here comes, you graduate from 12th grade. What do you do? I'm like, I have no idea. You know, I don't know. I'm, I'm not good really at anything, but here's something that I've been doing for the past, you know, six to 10 years. And I thought, well, maybe I'll just continue on. So I kind of stumbled into it gradually. And, uh, you know, when I was a kid, my dad would take us to classical concerts. And you think you just attend a concert? No. There's always a pop quiz after that. And he would ask, what did you think was good? And mm. I mean, so, you know, so mm. all through my childhood years, this training was happening. And I used to think, I'm only a kid. Why do I have to do these tests after a classical concert or whatever concert or, a, you know, church service or something? But so come time to think about college. What can I do? I don't know. This is the only thing I can do. So I went into it, and because piano was my main instrument, I went on. I did study church music. My undergrad degree was in church music because serving the church has always been such a deep part of who I am. And that just kind of led its way. Undergrad degree in church music, and then I had a kid. We had a kid before master's degree, another kid before doctorate degree, which is not the right sequence to do things. (laughs) But that's kind of how it happened, and um, and then here I am. It just kind of kept going on, Mm -hmm. being led by grace. Yes, yes, I love that. Uh, You started out as a singer. Do you still sing at all? Do you sing in a choir? Um, No, piano is actually my my first instrument, my primary instrument. We had to take voice lessons for many years. Being in the children's choir. Yeah, yeah, sang that, and I don't I don't consider you know I don't have a beautiful voice like um, you know some of our boy students here. It just, you know, it's functional, you see. (laughs) I I sing in rehearsals, um, but that's about it. I will not sing in public, um, you know, like even a church solo or something. Um, Yeah, Mm -hmm. no. So Mm -hmm. I don't, but the piano, which is very useful because as I began to travel more, it's this skill Mm -hmm. that allowed me to study my music. Most of my study, most of my music is studied when I'm flying because that's when I don't have to check emails. Right. And I can just focus on the music. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. Um, What kind of music do you like to listen to for fun? (laughs) That's a great question. Because my husband will tell you, you think married to a musician, you'll have a lot of music at home? Nope. (laughs) Because my head is like, do they still have those kinds of things? Like multi-CD player? So there's all these production I'm preparing for, next gig, next whatever. So there's constant music in my head. So when I come home, I don't want to hear anything. So it's really silent at home. Um, We don't have a sound system. We never had a sound system. People are like, a gas? No. Um, The only time I listen to music is when I'm like, oh, I'm preparing for Lord of the Rings. Okay, now I better watch Lord of the Rings and see the music match with the score that I have. Or, here's my nerdy moment. So I send weekly memos to my choirs. And so last week, I sent them a few movements from the Bach B minor mass. So here are the YouTube playings, Capella students. I couldn't help myself but to, and just listen for it. Well, I was sending out the memo, and it brought joy to my heart. (laughs) Occasionally, after a symphony concert where I've prepared the chorus, and it's Mahler, and we have just left every drop of sweat and blood on stage, and I'm driving home, I would kind of tune in to listen to some vocal jazz. 
just to clear my head, but that's mm -hmm. about it. It's on my car radio. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's okay. <laughs> would you would you describe music as work? Both. Yeah. It's work. It's a lot of fun. And here's the nerd in me. What's fun about? I was asked this question in the eleven o'clock class. When I look at something difficult, I'm like, hmm. How can I get the choirs to learn this quickly and such? That's fun for me. I'm thinking of, hmm, what do I bring into the choir rehearsal room that will help them to manage these? So that's fun. Um, that's fun when we're at rehearsal and I expose something to them and I say, okay, choir, here's my nerdy moments. Look at measure 52. That chord, and blah, 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 whatever. And it, when their eyes light up, that's such a special moment for me. Or when we're in rehearsal and something locks in and that choral math comes out, those are great moments. Or when we're in performance and everything locks in. So that's the fun part. Mm -hmm. It may not sound fun to a lot of you, mm -hmm. but that's fun for me. <laughs> I love that. Uh, what is your favorite song of praise and why? Okay. Um, you know, I, I grew up... Um, with the hymns, and so a lot of that are my favorites. I'll tell you a classical work, master work, that is, I'll say two. One is the Bach B minor mass. That's why showing up on my final concert here at Calvin, so I'm plugging that final concert here, several of my favorite movements. When I listen to that work, the level of craftsmanship, artistry, the theology, that work is high-protein theology. Mm -hmm. And everything is all together. And then, on top of it, Bach, you know, he used to get into trouble with the church authorities because they wanted to cut back on the music. And here's this pesky musician who kept saying, nope, 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 I need more musicians because this is for the glory of God. He ends all of his work with soli deo gloria, to God alone be all the glory. So when I listen to that work, when I prepare that work, it's everything in me. Mm -hmm. My mind, my ears, my heart, my everything, along with this company of musicians through the ages. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of like my old favorite. Uh, Brahms' German Requiem is the second mm -hmm. in there. Um, Requiem, of course, comes from the Roman Catholic Rite Mass, and the texts are kind of gloomy. You know, all health, iron brimstone and everything. And Brahms took texts from the Old Testament and New Testament and set it as his requiem to speak. It's a requiem for the living. So every time I'm preparing and studying for this, it's such a wonderful combination for me, for all of these. My mind, my heart, my ears, and the fun for me. Mm -hmm. I love that. Uh, here's a question. How do people who love to sing but have no talent fit in with such perfection? Hmm? No. There are many different levels of choirs. So I started out in a choir, and you had to match pitches and everything. What we're really good at in the United States, and this is from my global perspectives, is the United States, our educational system and our choral system is very wide range. You can find all different levels of choirs. I'm fortunate to be teaching at a collegiate level and guest conducting at a certain level. But it is truly astounding when you go out, when I go out into an international scene, that we in the United States have such a wide range and we can perform. So it's not just the top choirs that always get to perform. You don't have to join competitions. You can participate in festivals. So there's a choir, really, for almost everybody in there. All levels of skills. My first choir was a choir of four-year-olds. <sighs> I was 19 years old, mercy. There were about 20-some of them. Okay, four <laughs> years old, tone pitch matching. All of those lessons I learned teaching as an undergrad church music intern, those lessons have stayed with me. But it just goes to show that we are in a place where everybody can sing in a choir. Mm -hmm. I love that. <laughs> so you've traveled the world with lots of different groups. Mm -hmm. What are some of your favorite stories of things that have happened on your <laughs> travels? 
There's all kinds of stories. When you go on tour, it's so much fun. You live with each other up and down the bus and everything. But I'll tell you one story, which I cut it out yesterday because I thought my talk was too long. So I'll do a little coda here. Um, so we were going, I took Women's Chorale, Calvin Women's Chorale, to um, South Korea and China in 2007. And I thought, oh, we're going to be standing on the Great Wall of China. What better piece than to program Mendelssohn's Lift Thine Eyes from his oratorio Elijah. The texts are from Psalm 121, Lift Thine Eyes Unto the Hills. Whence cometh your help, your help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. We sang, lift thine eyes, right standing on the wall, great wall of China. So after two weeks of tour, and I'm looking like this, we were at the Beijing International Airport getting ready to come back to the United States. And the student says, Dr. Shen Kwan, can we sing again? And I'm like, we're ready to go home. But you know, when you've toured that long, I don't even have to stand in front of them to conduct. I just give them the pitch, and off they go. So I just, okay, go. So they started singing. We were at the boarding area. So they started singing Mendelssohn's Lift Thine Eyes. Directly across from me, I saw a man, a middle-aged man, and his eyes popped up. And then he puts his face into his hands, and his shoulders started heaving. And I thought, oh my goodness, something is happening out there. I hope we've not offended him. So we went, uh, we boarded, and he comes to me and he says, are you the teacher of the group? I said, yes. He said, I'll share with you my story. My 15-year-old daughter named Mackenzie loved choir and loved swimming. One day she got out of the pool and died. From that day, he could not go to any concert. And here, traveling on business in China, far, far away from home, God's arms of grace reached out to him. And he heard those words and completely fell apart. The music spoke to him. It tied him, and that's yet a part of his healing. And I will always remember that, those moments of grace. I am just so thankful he took the time to share that with us. But there are so many such moments of grace in the travels that I've done with my choirs around the world. I love that. Uh, you mentioned Gabe and his mm -hmm. health, your son. How mm -hmm. is he now? Oh, he's doing so well. So 10 years later, at 2019, um, he graduated, and we no longer have to go to that uh, regiment. And the first six years were harder, um, but the last four years were pretty good. He's doing really well, so thank you for asking. He still loves his Veggie Tales, his Thomas the Train, his Disney movies. You know, sometimes when I go out and guest conduct high school students, they wonder how come I know all these Disney and Veggie Tales so well, <laughs> because that's my day-to-day -day life. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. We are so grateful for you. We can't wait to see what God has for you in this next chapter of your life. Pearl will be available in the West Lobby to take your greetings. Let's thank our friend. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary.